Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Seven Changes You Need to Make to Support Extended Work from Home with Citrix. This event is brought to you in partnership with EG Innovations and produced by Actual Tech Media. Thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar. We've got a great event lined up for you today, some really cool content by an independent expert in this topic, as well as a live demo. So you're in the right place if you wanna learn more about supporting work from home with Citrix. Before we get started, just a few things you need to know about today's webinar. Uh, we want this to be an educational event. We will be standing by to answer your questions electronically, both during the presentation and we'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. So get your questions in early. We're here to help you with your work from home challenges. The questions box is there on the left-hand side of your audience console, and I can call your attention to it there. Um, we, of course, we appreciate all the good morning, good afternoon messages from across the United States and around the world, uh, but we also wanna help you to solve your IT challenges. We also have a number of handouts available there for download in the handouts tab. We have the EG Innovations work from home package. We'll be talking about that more during the presentation. And then also the EG Innovations um, uh, deck right there, uh, workbook, I'm sorry. Uh, make sure that you download those resources now. They won't be readily available after the event. And then finally, there's a link that will take you to the Smart Access, Smart Control uh, Citrix Gateway uh, for some more uh, technical resources if you have questions about that. Uh, again, excellent resources, and we'll be talking about those more during the presentation and after the live demo. And then finally, if you're watching this live, we will be announcing the winner of an Amazon $300 gift card at the very end of today's presentation. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. And I should mention that my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as today's moderator. And without further ado, I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenters. You'll hear first from Mr. DJ Eshelman, president of ThriveIT.com and Eshelman Enterprises, followed by a live demo with Mr. John Worthington, director of customer success at EG Innovations. And with that, I'm excited to hand it over to our first presenter. Take it away, DJ. Hello, and welcome to seven changes you need to make to support extended work from home with Citrix. My name is DJ Eshelman, also known as the Citrix Coach. Hey, let's get started. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to learn about me a little bit, and then we're going to go through the seven changes. These are seven focus areas, uh, some of which are technical, some of which are more just kind of soft skill stuff that you need to change to support work from home. So this is going to be less of a technical presentation. It's not a sales presentation. This is all about application. And so... We have some opportunities coming up afterwards to learn more about uh, diving in deeper about all this that I'll be telling you about. But for now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I have been a Citrix consultant for the last 15 or so years. I've actually worked a lot with Citrix consulting services themselves. So you might have seen me out there. Who knows? But I'm also the author of these books that you see behind me here. Be a Citrix Hero, which was released earlier this year, and Just Do This, a book I'm in process of launching right now. It's actually available on paperback and Kindle right now on Amazon, and hopefully within the next few weeks, I will have extended distribution, uh, maybe even to stores near you. Who knows? We might get lucky like that, but I've um, been very fortunate and blessed to have built the ability to write these books within this year and publish them myself, which is fun. Uh, but to do that, I did have to give up some things, uh, largely a lot of consulting work, but also I gave up my spot as a Citrix technology advocate. I say that mostly to say that applications for that program are open, I believe, until the end of the month. So go ahead and get on into that uh, program if you want. It's a great thing I definitely endorse, but I did have to leave because I have so much going on. And the usual alphabet soup of certifications, the CCEV, blah, 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 blah you know, all that kind of stuff. I also have led the Nashville, uh, co-led the Nashville CUGC or Citric user group community, as well as founded the one in Colorado before that. Most people these days know me as a YouTuber, whether I'm in my car or hosting the talk show that we now do called Thrivecast. I'm a life and career coach, which means that I serve not only people in the technology realm, but also others in uh, various realms of life. 
but I consider myself more of a teaching mentor. Um, but I've actually found a lot of other websites and things like that. I've been very, very active over the last three, four years uh, in various uh, ways out there. But that's not why you're here. You're here to learn about getting the work from home issues that you might encounter or already encountering resolved. And so let's look at these things from a pragmatic standpoint. First and foremost, we have three focus areas that I really want us to hone in on before we get to some of the others. And one is security. This is actually very crucial right now, not only because, well, we've got a lot of, you know, script kitties at home with nothing better to do, but also because users aren't always as focused about IT security when they're not at the office. And so that is a heightened sense we need to have as far as security. The other thing with users especially is the overall workarounds that they end up doing if they're not having the right experience or not getting the things they need and they're just trying to work, they tend to go around the things you've set up. And so making sure we address those workarounds is very crucial. And finally, we wouldn't be talking about Citrix if we weren't talking in some way, shape or form about the experience. So that is a key here. You obviously want people to be having the same experience as if they were at the office as they would at home. And that takes some special um, things that we're going to have to do. So first of all, security. What I'm going to approach with this is two ways of looking at this. One is the inside out, which means we're looking at data that is leaving our data center, uh, whether it's through policies or workspace environment manager or whatever the, the shell experience that the users have is locked down properly to prevent information that, that shouldn't be leaving from leaving. So obviously we're going to test these all carefully. Just make sure uh, that's like the first thing I say, because I've actually been part of some um, <laughs> engagements recently where the assumption was made and things were bad and doing this from a remote is a lot harder. So obviously I would say upfront and often test, test, and then test again. But uh, yeah, there's also outside in. In other words, we want to make sure that our data center is protected from data coming from the endpoints or from the users in. Now, what that means is we're making sure that we're not assuming that the user is in control of what they're doing. That is a fallacy that needs to be dead in end user computing. Users are not always in control of what their computer is doing on their behalf. And we need to recognize that and have the right kind of outside in policies to do that, which means that, gosh, if they're connected over a VPN, it is so much more important to control the interaction that is going on there. And so if we can, we want to avoid those at all possible and make this a better user experience, but also a cleaner security footprint. So number one, security from the outs inside out. Um, this is actually really simple. I'm just going to give a quick tip on this. Workspace Environment Manager, hands down, easiest way to do this. I'm all about big wins with little effort. And when it comes to that, um, we actually have been going through a uh, uh, supplementing a team, uh, working on a Windows 10 rollout. We tried to do all sorts of security things uh, with you know various methods of lockdown and, and all that kind of stuff. And I got to tell you, what ended up happening was we pulled all of that out and just did this. And so that's why I put this on the screen. There is a workbook that'll have these screenshots as well. So you don't have to worry about taking screenshots or frantically writing these down, but just know there are some things that, that I recommend. And I thought I'd give you the screenshots from exactly what we did in this environment recently. Uh, but obviously you want to work with your security teams and whatnot to make sure that your experience is properly locked down, that you're not having methods for having the users able to access or something accessing on their behalf. And, and getting that data out. The other problem is outside in, and I want to actually spend a little bit of time with this, uh, not just from security, but also from an experience standpoint. So the application of policies with Citrix is actually a challenge that I'm finding in a lot of consulting engagements that I'm doing where companies are just not applying these properly. So I thought I'd go through these real quick and just show you how this should be done properly. First of all, start with a Citrix baseline. I highly recommend starting with a using this high server scalability template. Scalability means you're trying to get as maximum number of users able to use a physical resource as possible. And so you want that to be as high as possible without sacrificing you know, quality of experience or uh, ability to work. And so 
this matters a big deal. This is actually one of the biggest things as security, or sorry, not just for security, but just a end user computing focused person should be focused on right now is making sure that this is done properly. So start with that template. It's very good. And then what you want to do is have exceptions to that on top of that. And so in other words, your baseline template has the highest number. In other words, it's at the bottom of all the policies that are being applied. I, I describe this in the book as being kind of playing Plinko, which is where you put the uh, puck at the very top of the thing and, and where it hits and ends up at the very bottom, that's what your application of policy would be. So that's the way this looks. So the ex first exceptions you need to make are filtered specifically for people that are connecting with a gateway. And the optimized, sorry, the optimized for WAN template works exceptionally well for this with only two exceptions that I've been making today. And one is to slightly reduce the target frame rate to 14. I believe the default is 16. Uh, which is pretty much a negligible difference as far as the eyes are concerned or the experience is concerned. But it is a big difference when it comes to the amount of bandwidth saved per user uh, across an aggregate. So if you're suddenly having to support, you know, a thousand uh, work from home employees and you were previously supporting like 10, obviously this is a pretty big deal. The other thing that I want you to know is that people are going to be watching videos, especially if you're on a VDI desktop. And the reason why of this is not just for casual viewing. There's training. There's the CEO sending out a message to everybody via video because we're working from home now and we want to have that in-person experience as much as possible. And so this is becoming extremely common. So why, what I recommend is actually using the video codec for actively changing regions only. And what that does is allow the codec to be smart about when you're using thin wire, when are you using uh, the actual video codec, which is a... Uh, a highly encoded uh, video transmission that's not line by line. It's actually much more intelligent than that. Now, the thing about the video codec, why you don't want to use that for the entire screen is because it's not efficient for that kind of a display. But it is more efficient in video display than thin wire is. And that's why using it for just those actively changing regions that are, that are under kind of a video or a, a rapidly changing uh, kind of thing like a PowerPoint or whatever, as it's actively changing, it's going to use that codec to transmit that instead of the thin wire so you don't get that tearing effect. But here's the thing. Video over thin wire actually takes up more bandwidth and more CPU. And so using that actively changing regions is probably one of the most important tuning changes to make when it comes to that optimized for WAN uh, template. The other template I, I recommend having on top of that is security. And you always want the security to be above any kind of user experience as possible. And so start with that, having the security control template, but look at this carefully. There's exceptions you might want to make, but the thing is you want to start with the absolute baseline of saying no one gets access to anything except for the mouse, the keyboard, and a view of the screen. You start with that and add things in later with exceptions that are filtered. And the reason we do that is because we want to control what kind of data is coming in and also going out. And the way we do this is by having filtered exceptions. For example, the most common clipboard. What I see here too often is that they just give clipboard access to everyone in the organization, which means every computer, every connection, everything like that will have clipboard access. The problem is if you have a threat actor or something like that working on the endpoint that's being used, well then, hey, you know what, that, that has free reign now uh, to use the clipboard in multiple different ways, in and out. So that's really important to, to know that you really only need to give clipboard access to those certain user groups, and you can filter these policies, you should filter these policies, any of these exceptions, because what they're going to do is they're going to make that the case, so it's overriding the, the security control, overriding the, the high server scalability, anything that's up on top with the highest or the lowest numbers, are actually the first priorities. And so that means that they are going to be the ones that went out. And so um, look also at smart access filters. In other words, connecting uh, in a certain scenario and making sure that things like hard drives are only connected to PCs that are actually part of the domain, for example, or that have uh, current antivirus, things like that. You can actually be smart about this, but it takes some proactivity and looking at this from a kind of more of an architect standpoint than an engineer standpoint. Engineer kind of figures out how to do things an architect is really tuned into why things are configured the way they are. So you need to kind of think 
in terms of why, not just what. Uh, and a big thing here, freaking smart access rules are awesome. They are awesome, and they should be used more than I see them used out there, especially in these scenarios where you can actually do things like a uh, what's called an EPA scan, where you're able to declare a certain criteria valid for a connection and give these people additional accesses that they don't have by default. I hope that makes sense. If not, um, uh, we'll have some time for questions later, and I can kind of clarify these things. Um, but if you have a premium license for your ADC, I also want you to look at smart control. The thing about smart control is it's actually affecting the profile, or sorry, the uh, protocol directly. And so you're not having to actually create a policy on the Citrix side. You're actually right on the gateway. So you don't have to worry about context filtering and all that kind of stuff. And so that actually is a great thing to look at. Uh, and if you want to look at that, look at uh, Carl Stahlhood's write-up on that. Got that on the screen. It's also in the handout for that link. Now, additionally, on the outside end, um, looking at the ADC itself and making sure that that is secured properly is one of the bigger things that I'm seeing right now. And this has especially been true in 2020, just because, you know, we didn't have enough to worry about. We started off the year kind of rough. And uh, this has just been continually a thing that I'm seeing where the ADC itself is not very secure. And the reason why is because a lot of people just deployed with the default settings and they didn't know they needed to change things. When it's 2019, 2020, and I'm still finding NS root passwords of NS root, I know there's a problem. And well, I can't disclose just how many I've found in the last year, but let's say it's more than 10. <laughs> a lot more than 10. Uh, but this is something that I'm, I'm finding a challenge with that people need to know that the default settings are there only for compatibility purposes to make sure the appliance can be deployed. Once it's deployed, it's your job to lock that down. So make sure you do that. Citrix gateway really, I think needs to replace VPN as much as possible. And I highly encourage you to do that. And there's a lot of reasons why we can get into, uh, security wise. One of the biggest reasons is it eliminates a huge amount of interaction between the servers, the network in general, and the endpoint at home. If you can just have it only interacting, it, it literally is interacting only with the, the Citrix gateway at that point. The, the rest of that is all proxied to the server. And so the server is only talking to that gateway. That's a huge, huge difference with the VPN where you have a direct relationship between that is just over a secured wire, but the information inside is not really secured in a lot of ways. And so that's really important. So anyway, as, when it comes to that, make sure that you are locking down the management interfaces of your ADC. I highly recommend using um, not only locking down what interfaces are responding to the management interface internally of the Netscaler, it's, uh, sorry, the ADC itself, but also using access control lists so that you can say, okay, I'm only going to be able to access this from certain administrative consoles, certain IP addresses, that sort of thing. And so we're locking that down so that it's not a risk. In fact, if it would have been for a lot of people having locked down using these ACLs, this the latest two big things with, with Netscaler would be a non-starter. They wouldn't have even had access to a lot of the things they've had access to. Uh, but because a lot of people aren't doing this, it's been a problem. The other problem I'm seeing a lot of, and I, I want you to check this, I want you to actually go into your ADC and verify this today if you can. If your account that's used for authentication there, there's a, uh, a user and password that's required to be able to access LDAP, whether it's LDAP or secure LDAP or the various methods to do that, does not matter. If that account is an admin on the domain, if that account was compromised in any kind of way, then it now has domain access at ad nauseum if it's a domain admin. I'm also seeing a lot of people using a slightly ele elevated account for this, but you don't have to use any kind of a elevation to actually get a query back from LDAP. All it's doing is saying, yes, that user's valid, continue with the authentication. That's all it's doing. And so you only have to be a domain user for that to be a valid response. And even then there's some exceptions you can make, but at a basic level, just make sure that your LDAP lookups don't have any kind of, um, as an account, and have any kind of rights beyond that. Because so, you never know what's when uh, a big uh, thing like CVE 2019-19781 is going to cause those accounts to be compromised. Um, and there's a lot that's been written up about this. Um, blog, ar blog articles I have and others have had and videos and all that kind of stuff. So that's definitely, if you haven't 
secured for this yet, by the way. Um, yeah, you are probably in a lot of trouble and don't realize it. Uh, this is a big, 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 big deal. Uh, I mentioned the NS root password. Uh, what I'll also say with this is change it on a regular basis, but keep it from others. Uh, whether that be in a secured, you know, password locker, whatever, but don't let everybody on your team have this password. They don't need it. What you should be doing instead, in my opinion, is having LDAP authentication groups for your administrators, not only because you won't be giving out the NS root password, but it's as easy as adding or subtracting a user into an LDAP group or an Active Directory group to give them administrative access or deny them access to your ADC. So I highly recommend that. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention here as far as the outside insecurity with the gateway specifically is that your URL should always be an A plus at SSL Labs. So that should always be what you're going for. And and I want to address something really fast here just to address a thing that I've been hearing a lot of. Is, well, well, DJ, I have these other workloads that are on like Windows Vista or an older version of Linux for a thin client, and I can't actually support these SSL ciphers that require are required for an A plus or uh, HSTS isn't supported on on um, I think it's Windows 8 or whatever. It's, there's all these things that happen, right? So what you would do in this kind of scenario, and if this is you, write this down. Make another gateway URL with that lesser security, but keep the default where everybody goes to the highest security one. I mentioned earlier smart access rules. What you can do is, again, you're making the default settings to be very locked down. And so you would only allow the higher security uh, ADC URL, or the, the gateway URL, to have access to those, those, those exceptions to those rules. You would have the default, in other words, any other connection coming in, always having a lockdown experience. So if they're on a, a lowered SSL, if, it, if that gateway has to have a, uh, a rating of like B or C or below, and we don't give them anything except for keyboard, mouse, and you know the ability to interact with the screen. Everything else is locked down until they can, you know, kind of join us here in 2020 and uh, have a modern operating system. Okay, I roll through this real quick. Number two, watch for workarounds. And this is something where, unfortunately, a lot of people just kind of get into this heads down mentality when it comes to Citrix that they're just trying to keep it running. And they're not thinking about what their users are actually doing. Uh, and what they're not thinking about is that their users are trying to get their work done and they may not be doing it as effectively as they could be. And so they're using workarounds to do this because usually of security things that are locked down too far or not appropriately or whatever, where they have needs that are being done in ways that we don't know about. And so what I highly, highly recommend is to make friends with these people's managers and get the inside scoop of, okay, what are their workflows actually supposed to be like? And what are they doing today? And actually dive and take the time in to do this. That exercise right there, just spending half a day and going through kind of a day in life study of someone's workflow can pay huge dividends as far as their user satisfaction, as far as dealing with things like excessive VPN usage, uh, dealing with things like, um, people sending file attachments to themselves because they can't access that file locally and they need to, you know, I, I hear this all the time with like executives that need to give a presentation. For example, they email it to their home PC because that's the only way they can get access to the file. It's this ridiculous kind of 1990s kind of workflow, but we're still stuck in it sometimes because the users just don't know any better. So watch for those workarounds and adapt. The other thing you want to look at here is some of the outside in stuff. And that is, how are employees getting information from the outside world in? Is there a better way to do this? Uh, so, yeah, are they using a VPN to do this, for example? Are they using a VPN to connect their local resources into the data center and just pushing files directly over there? That's why I say VPN of the devil, Bobby Boucher, the devil. That's a U.S. kind of joke there, actually. He used to say Skype is the devil. Um, that picture helps you with that movie from the water boy there, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. If you if you're sensing a theme here, it's because I actually had an incident that we were dealing with that had we not 
had VPNs as the method of access and everybody had Citrix Gateway, it would not have been an issue. But yeah, all it takes is one, right? I want to talk about user experience a little bit. And the user experience can be detailed in kind of two ways. One is the things that users are actually doing on the system. That's what we tend to care about. But I want to talk to you a little bit also about the user's experience as a person dealing with all this kind of stuff. And that's actually more important than it was. But in April, we were kind of in crisis mode, right? We were locked down. Uh, the whole entire world was locked down and pretty much all working from home for a lot of what you and I would have been dealing with. And so what ended up happening is we had a lot more users on the same hardware. So we had to kind of balance out expectations. And uh, a lot of people just didn't do this very well, uh, is what I was finding. You still had developers with eight vCPUs and barely using it, where your other users are struggling for resources. And there wasn't a lot of uh, thought put into balancing that out that, that should have been there, especially since it took so long to get hardware. And actually, it's still taking a long time to get hardware in a lot of, in a lot of places, not only because of supply and demand, but also because of budgets. Uh, budgets are just being frozen right now. And so it's hard to know if you're going to get more hardware to support your users working from home at any kind of given time. And so you have to kind of adapt your strategy. So this is true for a lot of people today. Bandwidth management is another big thing, uh, especially when it comes to the dreaded VPNs. Because if somebody is like printing over VPN, for example, well, that suddenly takes up all the bandwidth it possibly can. And if you're not managing that bandwidth properly, all of a sudden your Citrix users are all in a real-time experience, could all literally just be disconnected for a little while while it processes that job ahead of everything else. And so bandwidth management is really big. The other thing I will say about this that I've noticed a lot of flaws in is communicating changes down to users. The usual methods don't always work if somebody's working from home. You need to be more proactive and more appropriate with how you educate users about what's coming and help them understand we need to be better about this in a work from home scenario, not just assume everything will be okay. What we cared about less in April, some of this we still care about, but it wasn't really intended to be a long term thing. That's what we're going to talk about here. Login times, Citrix being slow. Obviously I say, don't be overly dismissive of this. Don't, don't just say, you know what? We're just experiencing a heavy load your, your experience just is going to be worse. Don't be overly dismissive of that. This is why I wanted to partner with EG for this particular presentation, because there's some things we can be doing proactively to, to look at this and say, okay, if somebody's having a bad experience, exactly what is causing this? And don't assume that it's just because there's more users on. That's not always true. In fact, what I'm finding, <laughs> interestingly enough, is that especially for those people using a server-based desktop, not a VDI, they are able to stack a lot more users on than they thought was even remotely possible. And a lot of the problems have actually been in like file servers and things like that. And so it actually is very important. I'm not just, you know, given the, the usual thing, but there's some things we don't care as much about, like how fast the applications are actually loading. And we know that's going to be a different experience if everybody's on the same uh, hardware. That's just going to be slower. It's just going to happen. Uh, but there's certain things, like I said, you don't want to, dismiss as saying, you know, this is just going to be that way. Just tough it up. Uh, but a lot of things like profile management, you know, we care about certain things, but you know, it's not a huge priority to, to fine tune the user experience visually, for example, what we do care about for extended work from home is we want to strive towards making it a better experience than what they have at home. We want to have that native desktop speed, not a factor. In other words, Again, we're trying to eliminate things like VPNs where they're using the applications locally and just accessing the data back and forth. We want to very much exceed that experience as much as we can. We want to eliminate multiple logons or, or VPNs that stay connected all the time and just suck down bandwidth. We want to make users essentially feel like nobody else is there, that they're the only ones in the room. They're the most important people out there. And if it's always an answer of, you know, other people are using this right now, it's just going to be slow. That's not a good long-term solution, like I'm saying. So we want to make sure that users feel, you know what? I'm like the only one here. I'm, I'm the most important. I'm the king of the world. Uh, yeah. So honestly, a consistent experience is something we've always talked about. 
and that's when suffering lightly, but that shouldn't be that way. If we're going to be working from home for a long time or extended period of time, or even permanently in some cases, like we were seeing earlier, like there's some cases where, you know, people are going to be working from home pretty much forever. And, you know, we need to make sure that the experience is consistent from wherever they are and, and actually live up to that ideal of, of why uh, we all bought into Citrix in the first place, right? Um, but identifying a source of issues and for real is actually really important here. When it comes for work from home, we all know this, right? We all have experienced the drama of somebody calling in saying Citrix is slow and it's actually their, you know, their dial-up modem that's actually slow. You know, the, the servers are fine. Being able to prove this to management is very important. And so you need to have that visibility, but also you just need to have the mentality to look for it and not just make assumptions. Uh, you know what they say about assumption, I guess. Now, making sure peripherals are supported properly. What I've seen a, an increase in, big surprise, is cameras, microphones, things like that, uh, printers even, like that are out in the wild. Peripheral control is a, a a big hassle when it comes to work from home. It's not impossible to deal with, but there's just certain criteria that we need to be very upfront and communicate with users on and also make sure we know what we're supporting and why. But that's the other part of this is always want to make sure that users still feel like they can talk to people in IT. Okay, this is one of the funner ones here. Uh, optimizing your Citrix environment. This is kind of what uh, I've kind of cut my teeth on, I guess. This is what I'm kind of known for. And so the first thing we want to look at is your procedures when it comes to every time. Most of us here are probably using some form of a single image deployment to multiple VMs. I mean, most of us are doing that. Uh, the, the number of people that have stopped, you know, that aren't doing that at this point are few and far between and, and probably should be you know, upgrading at this point um, to, to be able to support this. But if you're doing this, there's certain things you need to know. I cannot tell you how many times I've been watching this happen right in front of my eyes where somebody just says, you know what, I just need to get this image out. And they don't take the time to actually optimize that image. And they don't realize that that is important every single time you open up an image and make any change in it whatsoever. It doesn't matter. Actually, you don't even have to make a change. All you do is open it. And all of a sudden, you've got a need to optimize at some level, whether it's applying a software update or just, you know, things having changed on the drive at all. If you don't do these things to actually optimize, like the uh, BISF, the base image ceiling framework, it can walk you through all these things and do them all automatically for you. So you can just set it and kind of forget it and just let it let it do its thing uh, and while you go and do other tasks. But here's the key. You need to be thinking about how long it's going to take to do this every single time. It might take several hours to, to fully optimize an image. But the communicating that to management is a, a critical piece of this, saying, look, this update might be small. It might be only, only be applying Windows updates. But to keep the best performance possible, we need to optimize, which is going to take this time every single time we, make an, we open this up. And that's just the way it is. And so, you know, just communicating that ahead of time and, and making your expectations real there is really important. So, but the reason why this is important is that an optimized image versus an unoptimized image has dramatic impacts at scale. So it might be fine to have one single VM that's not optimized, but to have hundreds of VMs that aren't optimized, well, th those, you know, cut down on the amount of server scalability you have, it cuts down on the user experience for all users, and you're not getting any benefit to that loss. Every time, reseal. Um, verify you have good profile management or persona management, whether you're using uh, Citrix, FS Logix, what, whatever method you're using, make sure you're using it in a very effective manner. I want you to keep in mind, if users are having experiences and then calling a service desk, your service desk may just kind of default to the answer of just, well, let's re reset their profile and move on. And you know what? That usually works. That's the problem. But if users are storing their documents in their profile, then all of a sudden they've lost their documents and they'll be, you know, making noise and that sort of thing. So avoid those sort of things. You know, that's something I've been seeing with the use of containers is I'm seeing a lot of documents in containers, which is a big problem. So do it effectively. Do it in a way that makes sense. And, well, and if you can, have better education for your your um, service desk to actually use the tools and find out what's going on before they take drastic actions like just 
wiping out the profile every single time. Um, the other thing is verifying the settings for your hardware is appropriate. Now, this is not only important for what you have, but if you have additional hardware coming in, it's very important to not just assume that everything is set correctly. So do your research, find out what settings should be there for your hypervisor uh, versus the hardware, all these kind of things. I've got some pointers, but honestly, I don't want to take up the whole entire presentation because it, it absolutely would. Um, I've got training on that uh, elsewhere. So please do just make sure that you're doing this properly. This has enormous impacts on the, the potential for your system to operate it at uh, full capacity or not. The other thing is, um, like I mentioned with remote bandwidth, um, if you're having problems with the experience, you want to make sure that your remote bandwidth isn't being like exceeded or, or, or contested to the point of making a bad user experience in your Citrix environment. Remote PC is absolutely your friend, especially between a, a hybrid or mixed work from home and work from office scenario where they have a consistent PC. Uh, this is also, by the way, one of the quickest ways, I know this is kind of late for some of you, but this is actually one of the fastest ways to spin up a remote uh, working scenario is if you have a PC at, at the office, just install the, the VDA on there and it's the same license. So you just have a, a group, you stand up for the remote PC, boom, you're good to go. Uh, and no more VPN because VPN is the devil. <laughs> Quality of service, class of service, really crucial for remote, like we were saying earlier, but also consider using UDP if you can't. Now, there's a confusion on this where you're used to using UDP internally and don't even know it. This has been happening. Supporting that externally means your gateway and your firewall both have to be letting in UDP uh, in and out for, for 443, and port 443, so that you have to do that. So test that out. See if it works. You can stand up a, a test gateway if you don't have one already, which you should. You should always have a test gateway. And try that setting out and see how well it works for your workloads. Um, monitor memory. This is something I, I talk a lot about. In fact, the, the last presentation I did last year uh, with, with EG, uh, we talked about this in detail, how I actually was able to use these tools to say, oh, hey, you know what? We've got an issue with the way memory is being allocated here that's causing a lot of IOPS. And so we increased the memory until the IOPS went down. And the impact to that particular customer was huge because they hadn't yet upgraded to a, um, a, um, a hyper-converged solution yet. And so they were still on legacy storage and, and would be for the next year and a half, spoiler alert. Um, again, budgets get frozen. Uh, so using that appropriately is very appropriate. And so having the tools to actually be mindful of this is important. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot of is flexing to the cloud, which sounds great until you start having your applications in a separate location from your actual data. And that distance really matters. Any of you that have uh, been dealing with Office 365 and not having a local OST file, that's, that's the tip of the iceberg as far as performance goes with applications, especially anything that relies on a database. Trying to do that over a uh, VPN. I don't care if it's express route or whatever. It doesn't matter. You cannot beat having data locality. Uh, in other words, your your electrons need to only travel a certain distance, and the least distance possible is always going to be better when it comes to applications. So I'm not against flexing to the cloud or the hybrid cloud, but just make sure you're doing it in the right way, where your applications are still where your data is. And that, if that means moving all your data to the cloud or keeping your application servers with desktops in the cloud and access and, you know, use Citrix the right way is what I'm saying here. You know, I'd, I'd love to, to just, you know, tell you to go start using WFH, but, uh, or sorry, WFH, um, WVD, but honestly, until that situation improves and is, is consistently across the board, then it's just not a good fit. You always want to have your data right next to your um, applications. And then finally, I'll say with, when it comes to just, browser content redirection or, or BCR or HTMX optimization packs, there's a little bit of education for users that is required here. Because there's going to be th certain things that are happening locally that there could be little glitches on, but honestly, the expectations of what devices work for that and which, what, which don't, what has to be installed locally and what doesn't, there are criteria that you need to educate users on what to expect if they you know decide to work from their tablet today. They may not be able to use the same kind of tools that they use 
if they're on a, uh, a, a desktop, for example. So it really is important to not make assumptions here and don't make compromises that, that we you know can have a detrimental impact at scale. I'm going to move on here. Uh, number four, embrace. I do not like the new normal. I don't like that phrase. I don't like anything about it. Uh, maybe I'm just old, crotchety, and stubborn. I don't know. But I think there is a new standard expectation that we should be adopting here. And so really what we saw is a jump of work from home during the bird flu uh, back in 2008, 2009. Um, and back then I, I said, you know, a lot of the organizations will see this as a continuing value. I was right. In 2010, I was hired to go support 25,000 users being uh, put in a work from home kind of a scenario. And that's what I was, my job was there. Uh, following up on that later on, uh, finding that people have actually just kind of forgotten and brought their employees right back in. And now they're doing the same thing over again, which is kind of hilarious. So um, what do you think that means for me as far as saying with 100% certainty that this will be a new normal? And yeah, not very, not very high. But what we are seeing are new expectations that need to be addressed. And fortunately, this is what I, <laughs> I said to my uh, friend Steve, Steve Greenberg the other day, that you know, this is great that we were already doing this. We just need to do more of it and have a different attitude about it. Um, and that is doing things like supporting video conferencing. And uh, the BYO POC uh, stands for bring your own piece of crap, uh, which is what usually happens when work from home scenarios. Uh, but, you know, the fact that we can support it, you know, doesn't mean necessarily that we should. But at the same time, we should be able to be more flexible than we are to be able to make that happen when it comes to, making sure files are being all back and forth or whatever that looks like. Flex work is real. It has been real for a long time. It's just happening more than we think. And so now we just don't have any excuses. We actually have to do this. Uh, what I often say about this uh, in different ways, but I found a way to optimize this Friday, and I'm going to read this from my notes directly. Um, end user computing was something that was always done to a company. Now it's done for a company. It's a mindset shift there, and we have to be very cognizant of that. Okay, hopefully everybody's still tracking with me here. I've got a couple more things to, to show you here. Uh, what I want to do is kind of jump into less of the tech and more of the personal, because I think we are operating in that kind of a realm these days where IT is much more personal. We are people in IT, not IT people. So one, this is actually something that got really good feedback, and I wanted to share with you as well. I think this hopefully will help you uh, a lot. This is something I'll be going to be talking about a lot on my uh, YouTube channel and things like that. But for now, let's go through this list. First of all, to optimize your home life, start each day with thankfulness. I know that sounds cheesy, but if you can do that, if you can actually have that attitude of, you know what, I'm thankful to have a position where I can be working and there's not a lot of you know, some people have been threatened, some people not as far as their employment, but by and large, a lot of people can be thankful that they're able to be able to work consistently and a lot uh, because of what we're doing. We're, we're thankful for this, that part of the, the situation. That makes a difference. Um, I make a top three plan for each day. I, I sit down and say, okay, I can do a lot of things today, but three things are the most important. These are the ones that are, I absolutely care about the most that I want to do ahead of anything else. So make that, a, do that as a practice and you'll find you'll get more done with less of the, the fluff. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do the other things that are on, on your task list. Just make a top three and do those. The other thing is, if you, especially if you used to commute, keep that time. Don't just make that more work time. Make that an appropriate thing. So set a timer if you need to, but set it aside for things like learning and being better about yourself. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do, whether it's, working in your lab or, or reading a book that has nothing to do with technology, whatever it is, enhance your learning and use that time that you would have been using for your commute to actually grow as a, as a person and a professional. Uh, the other thing, this, is, <laughs> this has been important, and I think people have uh, been lacking in this, oddly enough. They've been working a lot more as they've been working from home, and they're spending less time with people that matter to them. And you know what? It doesn't matter if this is a Zoom call with your parents. Spend more time with people that matter to you. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, invest in your future. Honestly, buying books, training programs, whatever that looks like, 
this is a great time for that for a couple of reasons. One, you might have more time available, especially if you, you know, do number three there, but also there's more uh, programs that are available right now to support this kind of thing where a lot of employers are encouraging people to do this. Um, I even heard one that's doing like a, uh, a generalized reimbursement kind of a thing and saying, you know what, we're going to take some of this money that was usually being used to support you here at the office and we're going to give you some money for education. I think that's fantastic. And I hope a lot more companies do that uh, without, you know, checking in on how the money is used and that sort of thing and just trusting their employees uh, or even, well, like in buying things for them. I, I like that to a degree, although uh, not with the provisios that, you know, making sure it's uh, it comes with uh, strings attached, that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, connecting with your peers and your network. These are all really important things that should be done. Um, I highly recommend being part of the Citrix user group community. Um, we have a community as well called the, the Citrix Heroes. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to connect, uh, but but definitely do that. Definitely connect beyond just, hey, I'm having this problem. Who can help me? Actually make connections. Go to virtual happy hours. Go to actual happy hours. Just make connections with people that serve in the way you do. Number six, optimize your career. Uh, this is actually pretty new. This is a presentation uh, I just did recently that should still be available. I can get you the links if you if you want that, I guess. Uh, but the thing I want you to keep in mind is that technology is the minimum requirement for a job position, for example. It's the minimum that people are actually going to want. And so there are some things that we need to do in order to properly stay on target here uh, beyond just learning the technology. And so um, as a company with, with Thrive IT, this is what I'm founding this on. This is my new kind of venture and it's scary, terrifying, and all those kind of words. But at the same time, I feel really good about having four key areas that we're focusing on. Um, and one of these that's kind of one, of one of the most key is just a good mindset. And uh, we can get into this uh, a lot of different ways, but basically this is just saying that you have an attitude towards growth uh, and not being a victim. <laughs> uh, the other thing is mentoring. Uh, we see a lot of this in certain key areas, but I think there could be a lot more of that in the IT community specifically. And so I want to encourage and uh, build up structures that are able to do more of that. The other thing is methodology. My new book, Just Do This, covers this methodology and these soft skills in a big way. And I think that's a really big key. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, actually. Um, the other thing is, uh, when it comes to technology, yes, mastery is important. Uh, if you want to advance and, and grow your career and, and keep it on target, then Getting really good and known for a certain thing you know, is, is really important. Uh, being a generalist doesn't always get you where you want to be. And so I mean, in some cases it does, but, but mastering a, or being known for something uh, is really important. And so this is a good opportunity for you, a good time to start honing in on what you want to be when you grow up. I talked about the methodology. So I'm going to go through that just really quickly because I'm running myself out of time here. But the risk less methodology is something I developed a few years ago and embedded with a couple of companies and then wrote this book. Uh, it starts with understand. You might have seen this as assess or other things like that. But understand is the first phase. That's the goal. You want to understand what it is you're deploying, what it is you're changing, whatever it is. And next you go into a plan. After you have a plan, a design, whatever that looks like, you go into a phase of doing changes. And those changes, uh, just having a good procedure for doing that and a, a good um, attitude about that in general and uh, a way you approach that consistently. And an attitude of, hey, if something's not going right in the change process, we go back and, and re, redo our plan and then go back into our change process again. And so this becomes an iterative thing until we reach a, a, a point of steady state. And then at that point, we go into a maintain phase, which oddly enough, this is actually where... Uh, I actually want to kind of drop this off with EG and have them talk a little bit more about uh, the way to monitor, which is, I think, a huge, huge part of, of the maintain process, something that we don't think about very often. I don't know if it's just like we like the uh, the big flashiness of of doing new things and things like that. We don't we don't think about the fact that the majority of time in, in information technology is actually in the maintain phase. And so it's very important to, to keep that in mind. But also keep in mind that this is an iterative process. So that means that uh, when you're in the maintain phase and you notice that something needs to change, whether it's a you know, something as small as a Windows update 
or something as big as a new design. You start with the understand phase, roll into plan, roll into change, and then roll into maintain again. And so that's the reason I put that into an actual methodology to kind of make it straightforward for everybody so that everybody can understand. I am, if you can't tell, I'm super excited about uh, doing this. And in the book, <laughs> which I've been reading for my audio book lately, and I'm just really excited about all the things that I'm sharing. I'm sharing a good 15, 20 years worth of things that I've learned in information technology all in this book. So it's really exciting for me to be able to share that with people. So I encourage you to, to, uh, to look into that. Obviously I wouldn't be doing my job well if I didn't say to do that. Uh, but anyway, feel free to connect with me here on, on LinkedIn. Uh, there's a little QR code you can scan there or just look for me, DJ Eshelman. Uh, and we want to do a little Q and a here and I'm just going to put up some ways to contact me. Oh, before I do, uh, the Q and A session. We'll turn it over for that. Um, I do want to mention that we do have a promotion here. The here's it on the screen here: ctxpro.com/egwfh7. Um, this is a way you can actually get a bunch of stuff uh, from me that is uh, only available for people that have attended this webinar. It's my way of saying thanks for for doing that. Um, if you're in the workbook, those links are are there for that as well as well as the description of everything that's in that. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Citrix Coach. Um, I'm also on Facebook as the Citrix Coach, although that actually uh, might be transitioning out. We're, we're actually starting a page for Thrive IT and actually probably going to be focusing more on that. So if you have any questions, uh, we can address those uh, here soon. But I just want to thank you for uh, being part of this and encourage you. Actually, really quick before I turn it over, um, <laughs> this solution, this this login simulator, actually saved my bacon at one point. Um, and so it was, at a, it was at a client that didn't even have EG innovations and I was able to use this and it actually was so beneficial that they actually later ended up buying EG innovations, which is kind of cool. But um, this was actually a, a great way. We saw a, a problem area with them that we were able to resolve and they were very grateful. Um, so it's free. Try it out. It's, it's been great. So yeah, I'll just say that that's, uh, turn that over though. But thank you very much for your time today. And I look forward to talking with you soon. All right. Excellent presentation there, DJ, just tons of advice, tons of wisdom in there for us who are all working to uh, better our work from home situations for us and our employees. I'm excited now to bring on Mr. John Worthington of EG innovations for a demo, a live demo that we're going to do. Uh, John, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me, Dave? I can. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for being on. I, why don't you go ahead and share your screen when you're ready? And I'm excited to see what you've got in store for us. All right. So uh, what I thought I would do is you should be seeing a uh, log on simulation dashboard. Dave, tell me if, if you do. Um, I do. Looks good. And uh, OK, so so uh, DJ mentioned uh, the log on simulator. This is uh, free uh, and free as in free forever. It's it's not a free trial. So you can you can go to our website and, and get this uh, uh, for free and, and have uh, the ability to proactively test uh, your user logons on a regular basis. What you see here is the logon simulation dashboard. It shows you the simulations that are running. You can see we've got two that are having issues. And what the logon simulator does is test every step in the logon process web logon, availability, duration, enumeration, and application desktop or application or desktop launch and duration. Detailed diagnosis icon and you'll get a visualization that will show you every step in the logon process. In this case, we've got application launch issues. And in the other case, we had uh, issues with uh, web logon. I think, uh, yeah, it's authentication. So you might have an Active, active Directory uh, issue or whatever. So this is an easy way uh, to get started, it is one of the uh, two main components of our work from home program. And again, you, all you need to do is go to our website and, and sign up for free. Here's another uh, uh, quick, uh, again, this is just a quick peek. If you need a deeper dive, just uh, give us a call. We'll be happy to uh, give you more detail. But this is uh, our uh, available uh, through our EG uh, Express Cloud 
uh, for Citrix. And it's uh, basically a uh, user experience dashboard. It shows me all of the different users and that color coding tells me which users are having issues and they're sorted to the top. I can also search uh, for a particular user. So I can click on a user, for example, this user, Scott. And what it's gonna do is take me to a a session topology page. And so this is showing me uh, a visualization of Scott's session. It shows me uh, uh, the site, uh, the connector, the application, the Zen app server uh, that he's going through, which applications he's running and what the connection strength is. So uh, immediately you can see where the issues are for this person's uh, session. And you can also get a breakdown of uh, real user logon uh, not just a simulation, uh, and you can get right down to things like group policy processing and so forth. If I wanted to go further, I could click on the Zen app server and actually get to a layer model, uh, which shows me uh, uh, the, the um, uh, tests that were running in real time uh, uh, in this, in this uh, layer model here. And then for each test, it shows me all of the different measurements that we take and our analytics will automatically isolate which, la which uh, layer, which component is uh, causing performance issues. One last thing real quick and then I'm gonna hand it over so we have some time for questions. Uh, the uh, uh, the EG, EG Express Cloud also comes with a number of out of the box uh, reports. This is one uh, with work at home. We've had a lot of requests on. They they need uh, for uh, regulatory and reimbursement reasons to be able to show uh, what users are working. And so this shows the active idle time of people that are working at home. Uh, we had a, uh, when we started uh, first, when the work from home uh, explosion started, we got a, a, a tremendous amount of interest in this report. But there's also other out of the box reports like as a Zen app overview report that shows you user experience at a glance uh, by sessions, by applications, and so forth. So again, this was just a really quick sneak peek at some of the things uh, that we can do for you to assist you in your work uh, at home uh, challenges. And uh, again, uh, all you need to do is uh, go to our website and either uh, Try out the logon simulator or, or the uh, uh, EG uh, Express Cloud for Citrix. So that's pretty much it, Dave. I'll hand it back to you. So hopefully we have some time for a question or two. Absolutely, yeah, really cool. Thank you so much for doing that live demo for us. Uh, we do have time for just maybe a, a couple of questions. I know we've been answering questions as they've come in. Um, maybe we want to review one of these actually uh, from Paul. Uh, let me bring in DJ now. Uh, DJ, I know you you answered uh, Paul's question, but maybe you want to share that you know with everyone. Paul was asking out there if there's any apps or services that uh, you recommend for time management or career development. Uh, Paul, absolutely. I I actually recommend a a solution people don't expect, which is to go back to pen and paper. There's actually been some uh, science uh, in this as far as neuroplasticity and things like that and find that you're more likely to perform a task if you write it down and write it down several different ways. And so I actually have gone back to a paper planner completely. So every quarter I have a new planner and I write down notes about my day, all my priorities, everything like that. Actually, that has made an enormous difference. Um, I, I'll tell you all the time that I, I've been doing this for about a last year and a half. And well, I, I published two books this year <laughs> while still being an active consultant. I mean, that's the kind of level of productivity difference that it's made going from an app to an actual written planner. So I can't say enough good things about doing that process. Also, um, Hal Elrod has a great book called The Miracle Morning. And that is another great, uh, very quick read, very good way to structure uh, a morning. There's other uh, people in, in, and processes as well. I'm a pretty big fan of uh, some of the stuff that Tony Robbins has done, for example. There's a lot of that sort of stuff. Uh, as far as career path development, that is something that we are working on actively um, as, as part of the kind of new brand with the Thrive IT and things like that. And there's some some framework and things like coming out with that. So definitely make sure you're, you're following that uh, YouTube or, or just email me, uh, dj at thrive-it.com, and I can get you to some resources on that, but absolutely happy to. 
Excellent. Yeah, great advice. Uh, there was another question. Uh, Abby was asking uh, about slow Citrix performance and if we had any suggestions. Um, I'll just, I guess, throw that out there to either one of you. I know that's kind of a wide open topic, but like, what would be the you know top one or two or three things you might look for? Yeah, that is a tough. Or any one. tools um, to help. That is the, that, That's a lot. Of, that covers a lot of ground. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, DJ? You know, the honest truth is, um, looking from the perspective of the user and seeing what the actual problem is because slow can mean a lot of different things and in my experience lately it has been that slow is absolutely a perception from you know bandwidth being limited and so that's one of the first things that i've been looking at if it's an unusual if it's like just a single user or just a few users having that experience if it's a systemic problem where there's a lot of different things going on uh, that's where i'm usually looking into okay do we need to have you know more um optimizations done? Do we need to have less users per physical CPU, which actually, by the way, is one of the biggest things? Or do we see other things that are going on as far as storage and things like that? And, and also, that's one of the reasons why I, I like the, um, the, the, the free tool from EG here is it's, it's, it's an easy way to see, okay, is the slowdown coming at log on? Okay, great. If it's something performance related while it's, you know, uh, going in the session, that's where we need to go a little deeper and, and see what kind of uh, things we can find. But there's a there's a host of different things out there um, that we can uh, probably say are likely causes, but it's hard to know without more about the the situation. Absolutely, yeah, yeah I agree, DJ. I, I think I think I think what's interesting is you, you really nailed it for me. Is s uh, slow. What? How does the user define slow? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what? What exactly is slow? Is uh, is uh, spot on? You know. So cool. anyway, great advice. I know we're running out of time here in our Q and A session. Um, we'll do our best to get back to any questions that remain unanswered. But uh, one of the questions I want to make sure we get to is uh, for you, John, about the Citrix, uh, the EG Innovations work from home package out there. If people go to the website that's there on the screen, eginnovations.com slash cloud, can you kind of walk us through what happens after that? What do they receive? Well, basically, uh, you, all you need to do is uh, fill out the form, click Get Started Now. You'll get an email with instructions. Uh, and typically what will happen is uh, you'll uh, set up a consultation with the EG and we'll help uh, help you get started. It's pretty much self-installed, so it's very straightforward. But uh, what I advise customers is if they're going to go ahead and do the uh, the, the the uh, EG Express Cloud, uh, I, I would uh, try and do a quick consultation with an EG uh, representative just to understand what your pain points are and maybe give some pointers. The logon simulator, that's easy. You can do that in minutes and set that up yourself. Uh, you, you really don't need us. You're welcome to call us anyway, but that's uh, that's that's a uh, really piece of cake. So there's two major components, the free logon simulator and the EG um, uh, Express Cloud. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Uh, this has been really a, a information packed, uh, wisdom packed event. Uh, love the live demo as well. DJ and John, thank you so much for your expert presentations today. No problem. Thanks. And thank you everyone out there in our audience for joining us as well. Uh, before you go, don't forget to visit eginnovations.com slash cloud and also check out the handouts that are available there for download on the audience uh, in your audience console under the handouts tab especially the eg innovations work from home package that's going to be your best resource uh, i want to announce finally the winner of our amazon 300 dollars gift card prize on today's webinar that's going to brandon neal from pennsylvania congratulations we'll reach out to you to deliver that gift card uh, finally, everyone, I uh, hope that you enjoyed the event and learned a lot. I know that I did. Uh, this has been a really great session. Thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you to EG Innovations for supporting today's event. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.